You've joined today's webinar, Infection Control, Why Bother? Today's presenter, Leslie Rosti, is a registered nurse and the Director of Education for King Research, who owns Barbicide. Leslie worked in various nursing positions, including obstetrical nursing and infection control, prior to beginning work in the cosmetology industry. She's written many articles and spoken to audiences large and small on infection control in the salon and spa industry. Without further ado, I present to you Leslie Rosti. Hello. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to bring up the webinar, the uh, PowerPoint, as we get started. Um, as uh, uh, Jenny said, I am. My background is in healthcare and nursing. Um, you get to see a lovely picture of me here, but. Um, my background is in infection control, labor and delivery in the emergency room, and my training is in nursing and microbiology. I currently function as the National Director of Education for King Research, as Jenny said, and we manufacture products. Um, the one that people are most familiar with is herbicide um, for disinfection in um, the spa um, and salons and environments. So we'll get right on into what we're going to talk about. Um, I spend a lot of time out on the road um, speaking to conferences, to trade shows, to students, and one of the things that I like to address right up front is what I've learned from my experience doing that. I love speaking to people. I love um, getting to better understand what is resonating with them when it comes to infection control because I'm aware of the fact that when I walk into a room to speak, most people are dreading uh, my presentation, so I try to make it interesting, um, and hopefully at the end I have people not falling asleep. And one of the ways I've done that is to really pay attention to what people are um, hearing when I speak. So a few things that I've learned. I have learned that it takes more than HIV to scare most people. Um, we'll talk a little bit of later about why I think that's the case, but as you well know from your education, we spend a, an inordinate amount of time on uh, HIV <clears throat> as the sort of hook to scare people into doing infection control. And it really isn't working anymore. And I'll talk about a little bit later why I think that is. Hey, Leslie. I think, yep. Real quick, your PowerPoint is not up yet. I hit change presenter, so it should have sent you that message that you have to accept. Uh, yeah, I, um, and I did. Hmm. I accepted it. Let me see. I'll just show my screen again and see what happens. Did you see it now? Yes. All right. So back to where we were starting. So I haven't really missed much. Um, you didn't get to see my picture, but that's okay. <laughs> um, back to what I have learned, and that is that I think that, um, that along the same lines as HIV isn't very scary to people anymore, I think boring topics are going to require attention grabbing. So some of my attention grabbing involves some um, fairly gross pictures, so hopefully you can stick through it and watch those gross pictures. Um, I think because I said so, or if the law rarely works with people anymore, um, it uh, people want to ask questions, they want a reason to do things, so that's what this whole discussion is going to be about, why you would do proper infection control. Um, I think if I can make this relational to what's going on in your own life, um, if I can talk about what you're doing in your home, I think you'll bring uh, that sense of urgency that you might already experience in your home about infection control. You're probably doing things at home um, in a way that you are taking much better steps and much better precautions to protect your family than you might be in your work setting. And it may be that's not the case, hopefully it's not, but there may be things that you do um, with a, a more a higher sense of importance at home and hopefully we can bring that into the workplace. And I do believe that everybody wants to do the right thing. I think everyone wants to do the right thing and sometimes we just don't know. Um, I write for several of the textbook manufacturers and I recognize that sometimes the message that's given in the instructional piece is not 100% clear on what really is the right thing, and I'm also aware that all of your state laws aren't always clear on what is the right thing to do. So we're going to talk about scientifically what is the right way to do this. All right. I have this up here, um, this contagion video. I just like to show it because I think it makes a little bit of an impact. Um, we'll take a look at this video just briefly. Uh, this was the trailer for um, the Contagion movie, I don't know if any of you saw it, I'm just going to talk over it rather than it's just music that plays in the background. But basically, um, if you've seen the movie Contagion, it is about a uh, pandemic that strikes the U.S. And in 2011, when the movie came out, uh, Warner Brothers took a huge, basically, Petri dish, as you might remember from 
um, high school science class. And you can see here they're painting it with all kinds of different bacteria and fungi. And as an experiment, this Petri dish, which you see it when they're hanging it up, looks basically pretty clear. And they hang it in a, a storefront window in Toronto, Canada. And they let it sit there for uh, seven days. So the total elapsed time of this video is um, a seven-day process. And you can see what starts to happen to this uh, billboard. I always encourage when I talk to instructors that this is a great video to show students. If you have people in your life that don't really take this very seriously, or if you have students that really aren't um, as excited about infection control as they should be, watching this video typically changes people's mind. I mean, you see that something that had nothing growing on it visibly seven days ago um, now appears like this. So this was the uh, trailer for the contagion video. I think it's very impactful. And with the music, obviously the music's pretty scary. You can um, pull this off our website. You can pull it off YouTube. But if you have anyone in your life who needs to see this, it's a very impactful video. So there you go. All right, let me get back to the PowerPoint and talk about a couple things. Um, my background, as I said, is in healthcare. And I like to bring this to the forefront with everybody I speak to, because I have read in every single textbook that pretty much everybody uses, there is a sentence or a paragraph somewhere in there that says, my job as a nurse is more dangerous from an infection control standpoint than your job um, in a salon or spa. And so I like to draw um, people's attention to a couple facts um, within there. One is that um, I, when I ask an audience how many people they touch a day in their uh, line of work, typically the number I get is between 8 and 20. It really depends on what services you're providing. Um, you know, really quick services, you might be getting 20 people um, in a day. Um, but the average number I hear is between 8 and 20. And I think it surprises people when I tell them that as an emergency room nurse, um, on a Friday night, the busiest night of the week in the emergency room, I never put my hands probably on more than 12 to 13 patients, almost never, because nursing uh, ratios would not allow me to do that. So we both touch a lot of people in a very personal way. Um, if you are working in the salon or spa, you're touching people in a very um, personal way that a typical you know, retail worker or um, office worker, white collar worker, blue collar worker would not be touching people. Um, and I know you're thinking that I touch them in a lot different, a lot of a different way than, in a much different way than you do, and that's absolutely true. But I want to think about this as we go through here. Um, I, by law, have to treat everybody that walks into a hospital. They walk into the ER, they come into the labor and delivery. Doesn't matter what somebody looks like, smells like, what's in them, sticking out of them. Doesn't matter. I still have to treat that patient. I don't have the option to turn a patient away. And in your line of work, you absolutely have the option to turn somebody away. But I think it happens much less frequently than it should. Um, when I actually talk to people in the industry, what I hear is that people take a lot of risk because you don't want to offend somebody or you don't know what the words are. The words just can't come out of your mouth. Someone's already in your chair, on your table. They've got their, their hands out in front of you. Whatever service you're providing, they're already ready. They're prepped to do it, and all of a sudden you notice something that uh, makes you uncomfortable, and the words just don't seem to come out of your mouth. So while I can't by law turn the name away in this industry, I think the numbers of people who are actually turned away are very, very small. So we're both touching a lot of people in ways other people don't, um, and pretty much whoever walks in. Uh, and that's kind of where the, where the similarities end, because in my world, when I see somebody, when I go into their room, the first thing you would expect me to do before I touch you as a nurse is to wash my hands and put on gloves. That is an expectation, a minimum expectation in 2013. And when I ask people in this industry, when do you wear gloves, and I'm sure all of you on this call are thinking, when I use chemicals. You look at gloves as a barrier between you and a chemical, and I look at gloves as a barrier between myself and another person and between that person and every other person I touch during the day. And I'm not trying to suggest that it would be worthwhile to wear gloves during all, everything you do. I'm just trying to draw the distinction that while I touch um, people that might be you know, harboring more infectious disease, that type of thing, I do have protection that might not be offered um, to most people in this industry. And finally, I have um, one thing that you'll never have, and that is 
um, information. I will have access to somebody's medical record. I'll be able to read everything you've been exposed to, every immunization you had, what medications you're on. And even if I don't have that, in, for example, in ER setting, I can ask you questions about your sexual history, your drug use history, and you'll answer them honestly because you know it impacts how I care for you. Where in the salon or spa environment, you won't have that same privilege of asking those questions. So you kind of are at a disadvantage because you don't know who's sitting in that chair. Not only because somebody might be harboring something that's infectious, but also because you don't know what which person sitting in that chair or on that table is at the most risk of getting an infection. So we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I like to draw that parallel between our two careers and how even though your textbook may say that your my job is more dangerous than yours, in some ways there's a lot of um, things that mitigate that and make it a more, um, more balanced equation, if you will. So some common uh, sources of salon-borne infections, anything obviously improperly disinfected, any tools, any equipment, any chair, any table, anywhere somebody's bare skin um, is going to be up against something, <clears throat> that is something that needs to be disinfected, or you need to use something that is a single-use product. Um, another a common source of salon-borne infections is your clients. Everything they have and everything they have been exposed to. Um, keeping in mind that, um, for example, viruses are most contagious before anybody has symptoms. Um, that might be something they've been exposed to recently. They may not actually be sick yet. Obviously, I'm not expecting you to be clairvoyant and know what they've been exposed to, but keep that in mind, that everybody you touch during the day, if they've been exposed to something before they came in, they may be carrying something that you don't want to pass to another client, but you also don't want to take home for yourself or your own family. Uh, you are a source of bond-borne infections. Everything you have and everything you've been exposed to, including all of your previous clients. So now the equation gets a little bit bigger. Um, and the use of chemicals and heat implements um, really compromises skin integrity of both parties, both the client um, and you as the provider of the service. But mostly the risk here is for you. You are exposed to a lot of heat, a lot of chemicals um, throughout the course, of the course of your career, and it does eventually start to break down um, some of the, uh, the natural barriers that your skin um, would provide for you so that you become at risk of not only uh, carrying an infection from client to client, but also getting sick yourself. So you want to make sure that um, everything you use is disinfected for your own benefit, too. So I'm going to briefly, one of the things that the, when I do this presentation, I don't spend a lot of time on how to disinfect. Um, because I feel like you already learned that in school. It's what um, a label is for. Any disinfectant you use, any cleaner you use, there should be a label on there. And your states will all have very um, individual rules on uh, infection control and how it should be, what steps should be taken. So uh, I'll spend a shorter amount of time on how uh, and spend more time on why to do it. But we'll go through these um, quickly. Um, transmission, obviously, we know there's um, different ways of transmitting pathogens. Um, there's direct, which would be a person-to-person. -person. It's what we're all um, aware of. It's why you don't drink out of the same glass as somebody who's sick or use their toothbrush or kiss them when they're sick. Um, it's how sexually transmitted diseases are tr transmitted typically. Um, airborne transmission would be something that is a respiratory droplet. It's if somebody coughs, it's what's carried in the air and you can inhale and become sick from. Uh, if somebody's too close to you and they're singing, if they're talking and they're projecting uh, uh, a lot, you also can get it from that. A common, not common, but an uncommon, but very um, devastating illness, that's an example of that would be tuberculosis, TB. Um, fecal oral is um, obvious. It's typically what happens when a food service uh, person does not wash their hands prior to preparing your food. And the most common one that you hear about with that is hepatitis A. Um, I want to spend just a minute on this indirect, which is um, indirect transmission, which is typically through a fomite. So a fomite is an inanimate object where a pathogen can live for some period of time. So we see that in schools um, when the flu is going around that a janitorial service will come, for example, and disinfect all the doorknobs because that fomite, that doorknob, can harbor um, the influenza virus for seven to ten days. So they'll go around and they'll 
clean all the, the doorknobs, for example. In this industry, the one that is the most problematic to me, um, that is uh, something that we don't consider, I think, very often, is the wax pot. Um, if you work in a salon where your wax pot is used for eyebrow waxing, bikini waxing, any body waxing, um, that stick becomes a thermite and it's capable of transmitting um, things like HPV, human papillomavirus, and um, HSV, which is herpes simplex virus. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit further on, but I want you to really think about um, how many things can be fomites in the salon, how many things touch one person, and that pathogen can latch on, and then somebody else touches it, including you, and can become sick. Um, this picture is associated with the video. The video is quite lengthy. It's about 12 minutes long. It's something that you can pull off of our website and I believe off of the AHP website. I'm not sure Jen can answer that at the end. Um, this is a young girl. She's 26 years old and this happened in Jacksonville, Florida um, about a year and a half ago. She went for an eyebrow wax at a salon where she's been getting eyebrow waxes for years. And this is the result of not only wax that was probably too hot um, that probably caused a burn, but what you're seeing on her face is a secondary staph infection um, that she received while at the salon, whose motto um, when they go in and interview the person who gave her the, uh, the wax, they use one stick per client, which means they're double dip dipping that entire time for that client, which means everything that everybody before her had particularly if it's something that is um, not very, it, that is very, that is not very um, heat tolerant, and that, that, that's how they're getting that pass from person to person. So for example, staff can live at, at relatively high temperatures, um, at temperatures that wax would be most suitably used. So that's a great video to watch if you have the time. So we're going to talk briefly about the how to perform infection control. I said we're only going to talk about it briefly, but there are some things I would like to clarify. I think um, get misconstrued in this industry um, based on how state rules are written and how textbooks are written. So the number one thing that is confusing, I think, is the terms um, associated with infection control. Um, the terms are not only misused in these state rules, um, so that some rules, some states only require that you sanitize or clean, but some states also, if you read your rules, will tell you that you need to sterilize when, in fact, um, they probably mean disinfect. So I want to clarify for you what those terms should mean, and hopefully over time we'll get all of the states and the textbooks <laughs> to change so they all do agree. But sanitize and clean are removing visible debris either through mechanical means, which would be soap and water with maybe a brush, or with the use of a chemical cleaner. So for example, 409 makes a chemical cleaner and a chemical disinfectant. So the cleaner just removes what's on the top surface, doesn't really kill anything, might inhibit some further growth, but doesn't kill anything that is already on that surface, makes it look good. Um, disinfect is the use of a chemical disinfectant, um, specifically I should say on the label disinfectant, um, on something that has already been sanitized or cleaned, because you have to remove that visible debris first, and it removes or kills or disables all of the remaining organisms, all right? Things that you would be most concerned about in a salon. The exception is it does not um, kill anything that is a, um, any spores that might have been formed by spore-forming bacteria. There's a lot of discussion amongst um, people in the industry who are concerned with infection control, whether that even should be of any concern in, in a salon environment. Spore formers are, um, there's only a few types, and most of them are foodborne, like botulism, that type of thing, versus um, something that you would be at risk of in a salon at very high risk. So. Um, Cleaning and then, or clean, cleaning or sanitizing and then disinfecting are the two steps that most states require you to go through. Sterilization, um, in aesthetics, you will see some states being specific about some items that need to be sterilized. Sterilization does require um, the use of an autoclave typically, but it does um, destroy all microbial life, uh, including um, any spores that can be formed. One of the things I like people to think about when we're on this slide is I just want you to think about in your own you know, imagination, um, go home to your house and think about that cabinet. Typically, it's under everybody's sink. 
where you would pull out an item to clean your kitchen counter after you prepared a meal. And I want you to think what that label looks like. Is that label that you're looking at a cleaner or a disinfectant? Because if it's a cleaner, if it's 409 cleaner, let's say, then all you're doing is making the surface look good. You're really not removing that salmonella, for example, from the chicken you made last night for dinner. If it's a disinfectant, then you probably have removed some of the salmonella as long as you have followed the instructions on the back of the label. So all of those things that you might buy, the wipes that say kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria, or um, I think it says germs on contact, but it's got a little tiny asterisk. If you would turn it over and look on the back of the label, you'll find that there's a requirement for that surface to stay moist with that product for a specific amount of time. And we'll talk about that here in about two seconds. So step one we said was sanitizing or cleaning, and that is just the removal of the visible debris, and we're kind of reiterating that, and that it can be running something underwater, wiping down a surface, wiping out a bowl, um, or using a surface spray. Step two, we said follow step one always. If, um, if you are, for example, got, uh, cutting someone's hair and you drop shears, throwing them directly into your disinfectant, is cause for a citation in almost every single state. Because most states do require you to do step number one, which is clean it before it goes into your disinfectant. So step number two is disinfecting. I again reiterate, you had to sanitize it or clean it first, and then put it into a disinfectant solution that is registered with the EPA, meaning that when you get, um, get the item from your supplier, on that concentrate bottle, there should be an EPA registration number. That EPA label should tell you everything, every pathogen that product is effective against. It should give you mixing instructions, and you are required by law to mix it directly, exactly as the mixing instructions would indicate. And it must be changed at the manufacturer's recommended intervals. Most manufacturers will have on their label that your disinfectant needs to be changed daily. Um, there might be a few exceptions, but virtually all um, concentrates that are mixed have to be changed daily. And then the most important piece, and it's what I was referring to earlier, um, when you turn your label over at home to figure out whether you actually killed that salmonella from last night's dinner, or if you're looking at the disinfectant you're using in the salon, if you want to know that everything on that list of all the pathogens that we say we have been effective against are actually killed on that surface, you must maintain contact time. Contact time is the amount of moist time that is required to kill um, bacteria or viruses or fungi that are listed on the um, EPA registered label. Um, it's no different than the product that you buy at the grocery store for your home. If you're buying Clorox wipes, if you turn them over and you read on the back, it will tell you that the surface must stay visibly moist for three minutes to kill that salmonella from the chicken you made last night. It doesn't kill salmonella on contact any more than um, any of the disinfectants used in the salon are able to kill anything on contact. There is an amount of time that every item must stay in contact with that chemical to be effective. Um, it will vary based on whether you're doing an immersion, um, so whether you're mixing a concentrate and putting items in it, um, or a spray or a wipe. So you need to make sure that whatever you're using, that you read the label and figure out what that contact time is. Otherwise, you're wasting your time and your money if you're just wiping something down with the wipe and walking away. Because without a doubt, that product will evaporate before it's had a chance to be effective against any of the pathogens that you're really concerned about. Okay, and step three, if you're required to do this in your state for any specific items, is sterilization. It requires the use of an autoclave. Um, it destroys all living organisms um, by using the heat and pressure in the autoclave um, to effectively destroy everything, including spores. Uh, but it, it really is the most important piece when people use autoclaves, in my opinion, is that you are testing your autoclave per the manufacturer's instructions on a regular basis. Because an autoclave that doesn't work well actually becomes an incubator. It starts growing things if it's not getting hot enough or having enough pressure exerted. So you, it's really important that um, in any place where an autoclave is used that it's properly maintained. So we said we were going to talk about the reasons. I'm going to give you four good reasons um, to practice good infection control. And the first reason is one that everybody would, I 
I am cognizant of the fact that earlier in this presentation I said it's the law doesn't really work, but I'm going to talk to you about it's the law in a little bit different um, fashion. Um, it is the law in all 50 states that you prop and that you practice good infection control. Um, some states have better regulations that are um, written in a way that are simple to follow and easy to find. Um, some states have very poor um, rules and regulations, very difficult to find, very difficult to follow. I'm trying to work with each state um, that I can to try and um, make some sense of the fact that, in my opinion, all infection control rules should be the same in every state because the problem doesn't change. The bugs are the same in every state. The science doesn't change. The science is the same in every state. But I think you'd be surprised to know really the wide discrepancy among states. Um, if you haven't gone on your state's website recently to un better understand what the rules are, my suggestion is that you would do that. Um, you know, put it at the top of your list that once a year you go and look um, because these rules change fairly frequently. And it is the number one place um, where citations are written when an inspector is in a salon. That these are the easiest citations for them to write because these are the rules that are the most often um, not adhered to correctly, even with the best intentions. So that it might cost you as much as $150 if the lid isn't on your disinfectant correctly in some states. Um, if you haven't changed it per the manufacturer's instructions, I've seen fines as high as $500 for that per station. So it is important that you understand those rules so that you can follow them correctly. Some of the common infection control rules that we'll see um, across the, pretty much across the board and where people are getting huge fines um, are items not being cleaned prior to disinfection. Um, in fact, three states this year have enacted rules that require that disinfection not be done at the station. So the jars you used to see at the station, um, in those states, people are typically putting their dirty items in that jar and then transporting them back to the dispense to do their disinfection. And the reason for that, those states enacted those laws because people were not, there's no water source at your station, so people were not cleaning before they disinfected. So they were skipping that step. They were putting items directly into the disinfectant. I suspect we'll see more states start to go to those rules where they're requiring um, like a tub disinfection back at the dispense where somebody can actually use soap and water before items go into it. So we are seeing states be more adherent to that piece of science. Um, disinfecting covers being covered at all times. Um, I recently spoke to a salon owner that had almost $1,000 in fines because of lids being just slightly askew. Um, you can all picture it on the top of a jar or on their um, bin in the back. They had an open bin that people were just throwing their items in for disinfection on the items that were going in um, back by the dispense. And they had uh, $800 in fines just on that one item, on that one piece. So that's, that's a place where you can really get dinged. Um, making sure that your disinfectants are EPA registered. Uh, buying things that don't have that EPA registration, don't have that list of, of pathogens they're effective against can really cost you money in the long run. So that's something you need to make sure that you're doing. And that clean or disinfected items be stored in a covered container prior to use. And actually, I've heard recently um, of a lot of states who are also dinging you if you don't have a dirty covered container. So we all know dirty and clean need to be kept separate. They both need to be marked, and they both need to be covered throughout your service in most states until you take all the dirty items back to be disinfected and then put into a typically smart clean um, container. So that's the number one reason. It's expensive to ignore the law. You don't know the law. You break the law. It's going to cost you. Um, inspectors today typically just read the rules and they just go out and start writing citations because they are not from this industry. So they don't really hear, um, hey, it doesn't work in my workflow. They just write the citations and it takes a lot of money, a lot of time behind the chair to earn that money. So be aware of that. Reason number two is I think there are things that should scare you. I talked earlier about HIV not being scary. When I go speak to students, I'll ask them the question, who in this room is afraid of contracting HIV or hepatitis during the course of your job working as a licensee in whatever they're doing after they leave cosmetology school? And I almost never get anyone raising their hands, almost never. And to some extent, I agree with them. I am not afraid of getting HIV in a salon. 
but I was curious why it wasn't impactful to students. I mean, there's so much energy and time given in the textbook to HIV and hepatitis, you know, bloodborne pathogens, pathogens in general. And one day, I was flying on a Delta flight, and I looked down, and in my seat back pocket, the Sky Magazine was sitting there and staring back at me with Magic Johnson. And Magic Johnson looks amazing. And Magic Johnson has been living with AIDS, or HIV rather, for 21 years. And I realized that that's why people today aren't as afraid of HIV. They recognize that HIV, while it is a horrible disease, and it does change your life for sure, it is not going to kill you tomorrow. And chances are, if you follow your doctor's instructions, you will live a relatively normal life. So what I started doing when I speak to students or when I speak to trade shows or when I speak to conferences is remind them that, OK, HIV might not scare you, but there's other things that should. Um, the things that should scare you are the bacterial threats that are out there, um, bacterial mutations uh, that are really brought about by our overuse of antibiotics. Um, you will see that on this slide, for example, I have uh, MRSA. We're going to talk about it here in a minute in depth, but that's methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Most people just call it staph, so that people talk about a staph infection. But there are a million cases, new cases every year of MRSA in the U.S., and 100,000 100, people will die from MRSA um, every year. That's more than HIV and hepatitis combined. So why we don't spend more time on that in textbooks and in classrooms, I'm not really sure. But that is a much bigger threat um, because it is highly contagious. And it can be um, not only life-threatening, but it can be fatal within a very short period of time. Um, other, other bugs that are becoming drug resistant, um, tuberculosis we see. VRE, which stands for vancomycin resistant enterococcus, is a stomach bug we're starting to see. Um, that and C. diff, both of those we're starting to see in much higher numbers outside of long-term cares and hospitals than we ever saw in the past. Um, and now there's some new drug-resistant forms of pneumonia that, are, um, that have been in other parts of the world that we're starting to see in the US more frequently. Um, I want to talk about MRSA uh, a little bit more in depth. Uh, MRSA, as I said, stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Staph aureus is a very common um, bacteria. It is in all of our environments, but the methicillin resistant form is um, particularly uh, virulent, very, very strong. And in what I call the perfect storm scenario, it can be deadly within a very short period of time, like on the order of 12 hours. It can kill somebody. Now, I don't wanna, I'm not scaring you into thinking that every time uh, you get exposed to this, that somebody's going to die. There is certainly a spectrum of, um, in this image you see, for example, um, a little rash of um, papules, it looks like. And that person probably will just have those actual uh, papules. Those actual papules will um, continue to boil up, and they'll look like boils, and they'll get very sore. But they will actually be able to be treated with antibiotics to the extent that they'll go away. Um, that would be that sort of low-end infection. And while it's painful, it will ultimately uh, go away. Um, some of the risk factors for that would be people who have had um, long-term antibiotic use. You can read all these other ones that are on here. But the most common one would be frequent or long-term antibiotic use. Um, I often show this picture. I ask students particularly on the left-hand side. We talked earlier about how you might not um, have the words to turn somebody away. So I ask them, this person on the left-hand side, is this somebody you would turn away if they sat in your chair and you looked down and you saw this, let's say, in their hairline. In reality, this probably looks about like a pimple. It's greatly enlarged here for you know, magnified or um, detail. But my guess is most people would not turn this person away. It looks like an irritated um, a zit or uh, uh, maybe something, a bug bite. And I ask about the person on the right. Now, I get more people on the right to say, yeah, I would want to say I want to turn that person away. I'm not sure what I would say. Um, and then I ask them about this person. Now, in reality, this is the same person from, from image number one to this image. It's about 12 hours um, from the first image to this last image, which I'll take off here um, just so I don't make anyone sick, um, which I already did. <laughs> um, but that would be a, ver a form of methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus or MRSA 
that has the component um, of necrotizing fasciitis, so it's the flesh-eating bacteria. Um, in that case, um, typically when someone is in uh, health, the healthcare system, you notice on that picture before that it was a perfectly round circle. Um, that is not how those bugs eat. It is that we, um, in the healthcare profession, have to keep cutting as far as we can outside of the infection, infected um, part to try and get sort of ahead of the bacteria, if you will. Um, these patients oftentimes end up with amputations. You may remember the story of um, the girl in Georgia um, last summer or the summer before. She was zip lining. She was a healthy individual. Um, young, and she was ziplining and, and fell in the creek and cut her foot on a rock and actually ended up with a strep uh, A infection, very similar to what I just showed you. And she ended up um, having last rites read to her, both feet removed, I think both of her hands, and she was blind in one eye from the antibiotics. Again, not to scare you, but I know it's scary, one, but one of the things I always say to people when I, I try to reiterate while I'm speaking is, if you are properly disinfecting, this is one of those items you don't have to worry about. Every hospital grade disinfectant, EPA registered, that you purchase to use in your place of work, listed on the label, it should say Staphylococcus aureus, including MRSA. So while it scares you a little bit with those pictures, if you are disinfecting properly, you shouldn't have to worry about either passing that between clients or taking it home or getting it yourself. Um, every time I speak virtually, somebody in the audience will come up to me and tell me a story. And occasionally, it's somebody who was a stylist or um, an esthetician who actually contracted it from a client and had, you know, obviously they didn't die from it. They're standing there talking to me, but had some um, negative outcome in the hospital or something um, similar to that. I'm going to talk briefly about viruses. Um, viruses are a particular problem because we can't treat you for a virus. You go to the doctor, and the doctor says, it's just a virus. And they basically tell you to wait it out. Um, and people say, just a virus. But you think about just a virus, and you look at these examples, um, HPV, the mumps, herpes, um, hepatitis, really? I mean, those are pretty bad diseases, and they're just a virus. And the reason we can't treat you with medications is because, as you probably know, viruses live in our healthy tissue. They invade our healthy tissue. And so to um, effectively remove them or kill them, we would have to kill our healthy tissue, which is obviously not an option. So most viruses, um, when you, whenever you get a virus, they go dormant in your body um, after your body has successfully, your immune system has successfully uh, managed them, if you will. They go dormant. And some viruses have a um, unique ability to come back at a, an opportuni opportunistic point where maybe your immune system isn't functioning very well. You're under a lot of stress. You haven't been getting a lot of sleep. Maybe you're sick with something else. And the most common example that everybody knows is that if you had chickenpox with a child, as a child, that dormant, that virus goes dormant. And it, if it comes back as an adult, then you have shingles. All right? Same virus you had as a kid. It's just found an opportune moment to come sort of back to the surface, if you will, and give you shingles. Um, so most viruses are that way. Um, Influenza is one of those few viruses that we don't uh, see you having it go dormant and come back. Typically, once the flu season has made its cycle, we don't see it again. Um, I talk about influenza just briefly because um, in the last two seasons of the flu, we've seen some unusual things with the flu. Um, the, the flu is typically very quick to spread and very slow to mutate. That's very common. You know, you see a very um, sharp peak of the flu season. Um, but with the new flu, we've seen some unusual spread patterns. We've seen um, flus crop up in very high numbers in places that don't make sense, um, outside of major cities. We've seen um, huge numbers, like almost what we call it a colony of it, out in places that really don't uh, make sense from an epidemiological standpoint. But more importantly, we've seen it affecting young people much more than the elderly um, or infants. And so when I say young people, I'm talking about, for example, with H1N1, um, we saw that the most um, at-risk person of dying from H1N1 or getting very, very sick was young, healthy men. I mean, that was brand new. We've never seen that before in a flu. Um, not really sure why that's happening. 
but it is something to be aware of that the flu itself, all the influenza um, viruses seem to be um, changing just enough that they're a little harder for us to get a grip on and to know what's going to come next. Uh, you may have paid attention to the news um, late spring, early summer, that there was a flu virus that cropped up in the Middle East. Um, and then it very, in very short order was found in, um, in uh, England. And it had a very high mortality rate. Uh, over 40% of the people that got it died. And again, it was mostly young, healthy people. Um, so there are some new things with the flu um, that I would encourage you as you know the fall starts to come around to think about how you can better protect yourself and your clients during flu season. HPV, human papillomavirus, um, it's just a nasty thing altogether. Every wart you've ever had on your hand, on your foot, anywhere in your body is caused by HPV. Um, it can be nasty, particularly if you have a bad case anywhere in your body, if you're unfortunate to have and that have genital warts, but most importantly, it is the only known cause of cervical cancer in women. It is the cause of every cervical cancer every woman ever gets, and cervical cancer has an unfortunately high um, mortality rate, um, it's particularly in younger women. We're seeing more and more cases. Um, there's different statistics out there floating around that one in three people in the age group um, of early 20s to mid-30s, that one in three people has um, HPV. I've seen some research that says as many as half of people in that age group. One thing to consider when you look at those numbers is that HPV, like any other virus, if you test somebody today for HPV and they test positive, you might test them in a week and they test negative. So it's like every other virus. So those numbers are not very um, finite. They kind of tend to move um, based on when people are being tested. Um, and what age group they're in. But that all said, it is the number one cause of cervical cancer, and so it is worth our taking our time to make sure that we're not passing it um, to anybody inadvertently. Obviously, in this case, um, the most thing of concern in a salon or spa environment is waxing surfaces. Um, we talked about um, no double dipping, and no double dipping should be absolutely adhered to under every single circumstance. I would have this argument with anybody who wants to argue it with me, and that is a wax stick only goes into a pot, onto a client, and into the trash. It never goes back. There's never a reversal of that process. So, you know, those of you on this call, you may not provide these services, but you may work in an environment where these services are uh, made available. You may actually have family members that get these services. So it is worth thinking this through. I always ask this question, and I never, most people don't know the answer to this, and it's because it isn't in your textbook, but the temperature that is required to, to denature or to kill, if you will, um, HPV and herpes is 106 degrees Fahrenheit. At a 106 degrees Fahrenheit, wax is not usable. Your wax will become ruined, and oh, even if you could use it, you would burn your client. Um, so it's not is that it's not a safe option to turn wax up to 106 degrees. The only safe option is to never allow double dipping because obviously the outcome can be very detrimental if it's one of the few people that gets um, a case that causes cervical cancer. Um, here's some examples. On the left would be just a you know, run-of-the-mill wart you might get on your hand, you might get on uh, any body part and get on your foot. Um, to the right is a um, case that um, obviously, it's a little more prolific. This type of warts, when you get these, um, you're not just getting them burned off. These will continue to grow. It's a virus. Not much we can do about it. And this is the most discreet picture I could find of, um, this is on somebody's rectum, but certainly um, genital warts is a huge problem. One of the things that um, I would say about this is that um, warts, just like herpes, are most contagious before somebody has a breakout, before you even see anything. So waxing and double dipping, thinking somebody looks clean, is not a safe option because you can't see that they have the virus. They're shedding the virus most heavily before they ever have any symptoms. And about 80% of the people never have symptoms. They never even have a wart, um, but they can still pass it on and can still cause um, you know, cervical cancer potentially in somebody. Herpes works the same way. I get asked all the time if you go to get an eyebrow wax and somebody has um, done a bikini wax, let's say, on somebody with herpes, and you get it on your face, 
yes, you can. <laughs> um, you know, when people get uh, cold sores, let me say it's um, type 1 versus type 2. That's really just defining as above the belt or below the belt. It doesn't really care where it's growing. So if it can grow on your lip line, it can grow in your hairline. And you certainly can find um, plenty of documentation of that. I'm just simply searching on the internet if that's what you're looking for. But herpes can be the same as HPV in terms of transmission through um, waxing services being very, um, very high risk if there's any double dipping. Um, some of the hot topics when we're talking about other things that should scare you in 2013, um, Clostridium difficile or C. diff. Um, there's about 32,000 cases of that a year. That's an intestinal. Um, you've probably seen it in the papers. It's been widely talked about um, as we start seeing more of it come out of long-term care facilities, which is where it's kind of been a hotbed in hospitals. Um, and it is related to the overuse of antibiotics. But if you are somebody who was, um, you know, like most of us um, in America, over antibioticized as kids, I just made up a word, um, and you are exposed to this, it's very difficult to get rid of. And it is um, very, for some people, it can be debilitating. Um, there's an AIDS-like illness. Um, you see it kind of come and go. They call it still an AIDS-like illness. Um, it's mostly with people of Asian descent. And they do not have AIDS, but they have immune systems that appear to be like somebody who has AIDS in terms of being able, not to bot, their immune systems can't really fight anything. So um, we're seeing that kind of come and go. It's not contagious. But um, if you're a worker who has that, you're likely to catch everything and pass everything on. So it's something to be aware of. Um, avian flu, we've all talked about, you've all heard about that on the news. Um, that was the flu bug that we, one of the flu bugs we had last year. Um, there's some evidence that that's what's the um, cause of that flu bug that was in the Middle East um, late in the fall, or late in the spring and early this summer. Um, Klebsiella pneumonia, there was an outbreak at the NIH hospital, the National Institutes of Health, in August of 2012. And they had 18 people die before they figured out what it was. And this is like the pinnacle of healthcare in America is to NIH. But some of these bugs are very difficult. Um, not only to um, determine what they are once they've invaded a place, but also to disinfect. So NIH came up with even um, stronger disinfection protocols for their patient rooms because they have very sick people who are very um, immune compromised, typically. Um, and the other two, uh, increased age in young adults, you've probably seen um, some of that in the papers. We've seen higher numbers in young adults. So I think the fact that it's not scaring people um, may be making people less um, safe about their practices, but we're seeing more numbers in young adults. And then we talked about influenza. Um, but I only bring this slide up to tell you that the world's always changing. What you're going to see come next year or the year after is it's going to change. And it's going to change very quickly. And it's the risk levels of some of these are very low in some areas, but very high in others. So reason number three, um, I call this protecting your business. Um, and the real story here is um, it's a story. And it is, um, I call it a trip to the barbershop. And I have a 16-year-old uh, son. And when he was 14, uh, the weekend before Thanksgiving, he needed a haircut desperately. And I took him to the barbershop. And the barbershop the weekend before Thanksgiving is packed, as usual. And he didn't want to be there. So I sort of stood back in the corner and let him get his haircut. And at the end of his haircut, his barber said, do you want to come, Mom, do you want to come check the cut? And I went back to check, and she turned the barber chair just enough so I could see um, her jar of disinfectant sitting there. And what was normally supposed to be crystal blue, like water um, in the Caribbean, looked about like water from the Hudson River. It was green. It was thick. It looked like almost like gelatinous. Like if I stuck my hand in it, you wouldn't be able to see it. And I stood there for a minute knowing what I know. And I thought to myself, oh, gosh, you know, what do I do now? This lady didn't ask me to come and give her a lecture in front of all these people. All these men just want to get their haircuts and get home. And by the way, my son would die if I, um, if I had any kind of, you know, if I gave him any kind of a lecture to this one man in front of everybody. So I paid my money and went home. And the next morning, um, my son woke up and he said, Mom, what's this? And he had a patch of folliculitis. That's the, uh, an image that's up here. This is not my son. But that's what folliculitis typically looks like on somebody. And it went down um, onto his forehead and into his hairline. And it was very visible. As you can tell, this was pretty gross looking. And 
typically it uses a yellow sebaceous fluid, so like an oily almost looking fluid, but it burns and it itches at the same time, so it's very uncomfortable. And thinking back to the disinfecting jar that was behind the barber's chair, I knew exactly where it had come from. Folliculitis is just li literally an irritation of the hair follicles based on contact with um, some pathogen, usually a low-level one, but he just happened to, you know, it happened to irritate his skin. And my initial inclination that day, and I tell people this all the time, my initial inclination on that Sunday morning was to post a picture similar to this one on Facebook. I have thousands of friends on Facebook. They all live in, pretty much a good portion live in my same zip code. And I was going to tell them what barber shop, what chair, and that's where it came from. My second inclination was to call the inspector, who I happen to know, and say, go in there. Get that. You know, I wanted that barber fired. I was furious. My, my poor son was going to have to go to school for the three days before Thanksgiving holiday looking like this. Um, and uncomfortable. And as it turns out, I thought better of it and decided to go in on Tuesday morning when the barber opened the shop again and the owner. And I went in on Tuesday morning and what I said to him was, what happened to my son will not kill him, but it likely could kill your business. You can't send people out looking like this. You can't make people feel worse than when they came in. This would have never happened had somebody properly disinfected the combs or the shears that they had used on my son. So while the, the section before on things that could kill you is really scary and you may think it would never happen to you, you may think the inspector would never ever come into your salon. Maybe the inspectors in your state only come when there's a, a complaint filed, I don't know. But this could happen. Somebody could come into your salon if you're not disinfecting every item properly and walk out with something like this. And that could kill your business. It, you know, to me, it's no different than, you know, if somebody worked in a food service place and was fitting in the food. You're, you wouldn't do that. So take the time to do the right thing, to properly disinfect every item so that nobody walks out work, looking worse than they came in or feeling worse about themselves. Another example of that, obviously, would be ringworm. You look at these um, gentlemen with ringworm, and if you know anything about ringworm, you know that they are going to be fighting this for a very long time. Ringworm is a fungus, and it's a very difficult fungus to treat. So um, I would encourage you to take the time to do the right thing so these people don't become their clients. And then finally, the last reason is you don't know what you don't know. Um, you really don't know who is sitting in your chair any time that you do a service. You don't know what their history is and what puts them at higher risk of infection. I talked earlier, some people are at much higher risk. Um, some of these people would be people that have immune system is impaired by medication, it's unless it's undiagnosed. So if you don't know you have it, you can't tell anybody you have it. Um, if they're harboring a virus that's not currently active, if it doesn't come, you know, that um, shingles is just waiting to come out, so to speak. Um, people who've had a surgical or medical intervention typically will tell you that, but there are some cases of people that won't still know to tell you. If they've traveled outside of the U.S., obviously um, that's probably something you'll know. Um, but if they have a high-risk occupation, um, one of the highest risk occupations, for example, for transmitting illness is somebody who works in a long-term care facility. Because a lot of illnesses that don't do very well out in the general public thrive in long-term care facilities. And the way they make their way from those long-term care facilities into the general public, a lot of times it's on the hands of people that work there. So um, the first person I want to talk about, and this is probably grossing some of you out, um, is the diabetic client. You know, in our industry, we ask a lot when somebody is getting a pedicure. Are you a diabetic? And one of the problems with that question is that 82% uh, of diabetics go a full five years before they're diagnosed. And during those five years, they're going to say, no, nope, I'm not a diabetic. And in fact, they will be. And these are some of the types of outcomes you can get from a diabetic client who gets an injury. For example, in these cases, these are, would be examples of pedicure injuries. Um, somebody who gets because they lose the, the, the nerve sensation on the bottom of their feet um, over time, um, something that might be a very obvious infection to you and I, we might catch it early. You can see these people don't catch it till very, very late because they can't feel it. Um, the pain sensation that we would get, they don't get. My suggestion is not that you don't ask the question. You can ask the question, but my suggestion is that you treat every single person that comes into your place of business as though they might be a diabetic. 
and that is you make sure that if you nick somebody or if you nick them with the clippers, because remember, their ability to fight infection and their um, proclivity to getting infection doesn't change based on the body part. You nick them um, with the clippers on, on the top of the ear. You nick their hand when you're doing a manicure. You nick their feet when you're doing a pedicure. They're still at the same high risk. I want you to treat everyone as other they're possibly a diabetic because some people don't know. And I, by doing so, I want you to make sure that every implement you've ever used is properly disinfected. So that if you nick them, you're not also introducing a pathogen that could make them have this type of outcome. Um, another person I want to talk about is a person who's had a woman who's had an mastectomy or a lumpectomy for breast cancer. You can see in this image um, of the woman who's clearly had a mastectomy. You can see that her one arm, her right arm, is much, much larger than her left arm. It's very obvious in the other picture that um, there's this uncontrolled swelling. And in a patient who's had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy for breast cancer, we remove the lymph nodes that run through their armpit um, for diagnostic purposes. And it also removes the ability of that limb to remove fluid from itself. Um, so if there's an infection, that, that body part just continues to swell and swell and swell. Um, lymphedema is a permanent condition, so that both of these women will permanently be battling this. Um, they can wear compression garments to reduce the size, but it's always going to be a battle for them. So we prefer not to get that um, started. Um, these women, for example, when getting a manicure, if they were nicked um, and a pathogen was introduced into that um, tissue, they could develop this condition. Um, I spoke at a school one time where a woman, her right single right arm weighed 60 pounds from lymphedema. So think about what the 60 extra pounds on one side of your body does to your back, does to your ability to work, to buy clothes even, all of the things that are impacted um, based on the fact that she got an infection in her hand. These women won't come in and tell you because I know that because when I would discharge them from the hospital, what I would say to them is, Never let anyone stick a needle in that arm. So that means no, no immunizations and no blood draws. Never let anybody put a blood pressure cuff on that arm. Never stick that hand in an oven. And never garden without a glove on, a hand, on that hand. And I was telling them to protect that hand from infectious process. And in retrospect, I probably should have said never go get a manicure without having a very serious conversation with the person providing that service. Again, this may not be a service you provide, but you may work in a place where this is provided. You may have a loved one in your life who has had a mastectomy or lumpectomy, and I hope you pass that information on to them. And the final person is somebody who's on medication for um, anything along the lines of asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, um, fibromyalgia, uh, any type of autoimmune disorder. Um, they're on a glucocorticoid. And what those medications do is they are intended to calm down the immune system, because in all those cases, the immune system is overactive. If you have a child, um, a school-aged child that has asthma, you know your child is the first one to get sick in the classroom and they stay sick the longest. It's because the medication they're on to prevent an asthma attack is also impairing their immune system to some extent. Um, when you're watching TV the next time an ad comes on for virtually every medication except for Viagra and Cialis, you'll hear the commentator say, before you start taking this medication, tell your doctor if you've been exposed to tuberculosis. Do not take this medication if you live in an area where certain fungal infections are common. Do not take this medication if you currently have an infection. This medication will make you more prone to infection. They tell you that. It's right out there. But again, these people won't come in and tell you those are the medications they're on. So you need to act like everybody may be on those medications to prevent one of these infections that can make them very, very sick. So in, in for all of these people who are going to come in, aren't going to tell you their circumstance, I want to reiterate, the safety net is that you are disinfecting properly between every client. You will not be passing these diseases on to them or taking them home to your own family. All right? So in closing, I'm going to go through just a couple of things. Um, how to prepare your business um, properly, particularly as we start to get ready for cold and flu season again. Um, supply hand sanitizer and tissue at every workstation. Make sure that you're um, encouraging your clients to use a hand sanitizer. It's not the preferred method. I prefer they could get it and wash their hands, but um, time being as uh, precious as it is, I understand hand sanitizer might be the only option. Um, I want you to stock plenty of disinfecting solution. 
know the level of disinfection that's required and adhere to those standards. By that I mean what things need to be disinfected, what things need to be thrown away as single-use items, um, and know what length of time that disinfection, uh, what's required in terms of contact time for that disinfectant to work. Consider if you need additional, additional disinfection of common use surfaces during cold and flu season, um, your phones, your countertops, uh, anything that people put their hands on all the time, you know, walk through your salon, think to yourself, what is everybody touching that I need to properly disinfect? Um, encourage your staff to stay home when they're sick. If, if you are sick, stay home. I understand time is money, but um, if a cold or flu runs through the salon or spa, um, it can be really devastating to the business as a whole, but also to your clients. Um, you can do a great thing by cross-training employees to fill in. Um, as much as possible. This I'm saying particularly for like a front desk position. Um, you know, if everybody knows how to run the computer and schedule appointments, then if the receptionist, a person is sick, um, you're not asking them to come in and touch all of your stuff and all of your clients' stuff. Um, you can, you know, cover for a day or two while that person comes sick. And allow your customers to cancel without penalty when they're sick. I realize again there will be people that will abuse that, but. Um, I think there will be fewer people than abuse, that abuse it than allowing people to really cancel so they're not coming in when they're sick or bringing their kids in to sit and play who are homesick from school. You really don't want that um, in your environment. Um, I've heard of that a million times and I think who would want that in their environment. And then for you yourself, use antibiotics correctly when they're prescribed. Take them as they're prescribed for the length of time. Stop smoking if you smoke. Stop being exposed to cigarette smoke. It is really hard on your immune system. Um, Get as much sleep as possible. There's tons of evidence that eight hours of sleep a night does help your immune system. It allows your tissues to regrow, uh, to regenerate, and um, it is, it's probably the number one thing that we all skimp on and we shouldn't be. Um, I say eight glasses a habit. Um, I, I'm not a huge water fan, um, so I understand when people don't want to drink eight glasses of water, but eight glasses of some fluid a day that um, is not an alcohol or caffeine-related um, fluid is really helpful to your immune system. Stay home when you're sick. Get immunized. Talk to your doctor about immunizations you should have in this high contact area that you work in. Um, the eight women in the age group from 32 to 47 are the most under immunized group in the United States. We all get our kids immunized and we don't get immunized. So here's some examples of things I would encourage you to talk to your physician about. Hepatitis B, pneumonia, influenza, tetanus. Where are you in that immunization process? Um, exercise, again, helps your immune system. Eating your vitamins, meaning rather than taking them in a pill, try to have a really healthy diet that includes all the vitamins you would need. And most importantly, during cold and flu season, keep your hands to yourself as much as possible. Avoid shaking hands. Really be conscious of not touching your own face. Um, if you can really avoid touching your own face, if you can cut down the number of times you touch your own face in an hour to less than 10 times in an hour, and you'd be surprised how frequently you touch your own face. If you can cut it down to less than 10 times in an hour, you will cut your risk of catching the flu this flu season by almost 50% by just doing that single thing. So really pay attention to how frequently you touch your face. Um, the other thing that's becoming a real serious issue is cell phones. Um, I run a disinfecting wipe over my cell phone at least once a day because your cell phone sits on surfaces, sometimes with the side down that you're going to put closest to your face. And again, pathogens can take a nice little ride on there and ride into you. So, um, and then talking to your clients. Make your infection control efforts visible. Make them feel safe that you're doing all of these things. It allows them to open up and ask questions about what you're doing. Um, you know, discuss that with them openly. Make it relaxing for them that it's a safe experience, that all the things they see on TV are not happening in your salon or spa. Um, encourage them to ask questions about anything along the way, any process or any medical concerns they have. Um, I don't want you to necessarily become a medical expert. I want you to let them voice their questions, um, but then encourage them to talk to their physician, um, but reassure them that the experience they've had when they're with you has been a safe one, that you have done everything to make sure that um, there's nothing in your salon or spa that they could have contracted while they were there. So all of that said and done, um, you are now Barbicide certified. Um, it's a program that we run through our um, website. It's um, uh, you, if someone, anybody can do it. It's free of charge. 
um, by going to our website, which is www.barbicide.com. They can take a class similar to this. It's on a PowerPoint. Um, it's free of charge. And at the end of it, they can print the certificate. Because you have all um, attended this webinar, um, Jenny will send me all of your email addresses. You can expect an email from me within a week. Um, I will ask you to send me back what you want printed on your certificate in terms of your name, any credentials, exactly how you want it spelled, and a mailing address. I will need a mailing address. I will send you a um, certificate that says you're certified and a lapel pin that you can wear on your smock or your apron that says you're barbicide certified and a window cling that you can put on your mirror, on your um, the door for your place of business saying that um, you have been um, barbicide certified. So again, expect an email from me. And my name is Leslie Rossi. Expect that email within the week. And um, if you reply to it with your mailing address, um, all of those things will be mailed to you directly um, at your place of business or home, whatever you indicate. And I appreciate your time. And I'm done, Jen. Great. Can you advance to the next slide, please? Perfect. Thank you. Okay, there you go. All right. Well, um, in just a few minutes, we're going to take any questions that you might have. I do have a few lined up for you, um, but I'm going to give you a few seconds to type in any other questions in the question box on the right um, bottom right-hand side of your screen. So definitely ask questions while we have Leslie here online. Um, so real quickly, though, I just wanted to reiterate that this webinar was sponsored by Associated Hair Professionals. And we are a national association supporting hair stylists, barbers, and nail professionals. Um, one of our membership benefits is actually liability insurance. And that's designed to protect you from a client saying that you caused them harm in some way, shape, or form. Um, infection control absolutely fits into the liability category. Um, and some places, um, some companies will not cover you under their insurance if you have a claim from an infection. Um, so it's a really sore spot for different salons. Um, so that's definitely something that you want to be aware of. Um, so we do include liability insurance in our membership. Uh, we also give you a free website and uh, free marketing resources that you can use to help build and maintain a clientele. We also give you discounts on things like cell phone service so that your um, your clients can call in and set appointments. We also work with a company that allows you to uh, book online and get a discount for that subscription. So we've got all sorts of really good discounts set up. And one of the other things we provide is education such as this to help you keep up with what's going on in the industry. So uh, we do offer two different levels of membership. And the first is professional level, and that is for licensed professionals. And that is $179 a year. And then we offer a student level of membership for $45 a year. If you are interested in the professional membership um, and you have gone through this barbicide certification, we do give you a discount on your membership. So if you're interested, definitely give us a call at 1-800-575-4642. Uh, you can hop on our website or we'll be sending you some follow-up emails um, and those will come directly from me so you can always ask more questions there. So with that, we have a few questions for you, Leslie. So I'm going to go ahead and just um, start from the very beginning. Um, which states require the tub method of disinfection? Good question. Right now it is Oklahoma. Uh, well, Oklahoma is requiring they will not allow you to put anything but combs in the upright containers. So you can have combs at your station in an upright container. Everything else has to be done back at the, um, well, it doesn't have to be done at the dispense, wherever there's a water source. That's how it's qualified. Louisiana is requiring everything to be done in the tub. And Virginia is requiring everything to be done in the tub starting in 2014. Okay. Perfect. Um, I had somebody just ask if they will receive the PowerPoint slides. Um, so what you will receive is the actual recording of this webinar, um, which is the actual slides. Um, if you would like just the PowerPoint slides themselves, definitely feel free to shoot me an email at info at and I can send those to you alone. 
Um, and then we have a question, Leslie, why is the glass jar that holds the Barbicide Plus referred to as a wet sanitizer since we are not sanitizing but in fact disinfecting? This is in the textbooks for cosmetology as well, and it's confusing. You are exactly right. Whoever asked that question, amen. Um, it's been sort of the bane of my existence uh, that these terms are not used correctly. You'll notice in um, the Malady, for example, textbook, the 2014 edition, at the beginning of um, Chapter 5, they did put a little disclaimer piece saying that they were going to, from here on out, change their language um, to better reflect what I said to you, clean and sanitize being um, one process separate from disinfection. I think the reason that the wet sanitizer was continued, um, you, continued to be used in textbooks is that many states still refer to it that way in their rules. Slowly but surely we're getting those changed into uh, something that makes more sense, like a disinfecting container or a wet disinfector. You know, people are trying to toy with the terms, but sanitizing is such a um, well embedded, you know, it's, it's so embedded in this industry that it's sort of hard to get rid of it. But you are right, we are not disinfecting in a, we are not sanitizing in a disinfecting jar, we're disinfecting. So you were right, textbook state rules are typically not correct, but we're changing them. Okay, and then I do have one question actually that fits right into that. Um, what, are, what are you doing in order to influence the change at the state board level? Um, I personally spend about half the time, uh, uh, half of my time working either with the textbook manufacturers or the state boards to try and, and the reason I bring them both up is it's sort of a chicken and the egg. Um, to change a textbook, I also have to change what the state board exam says. I can't take something out of a textbook that's still on the state board exam, and the state board exam doesn't want to change their questions unless the textbook reflects it. So on that end, I'm working with both of them to try and um, move very slowly to get uh, the textbooks to change and the state um, board exams to change. From an ongoing perspective of state rules, uh, I probably have about six states every year ask me to review their rules and give them uh, new terminology that they can use or to streamline what their rules say. We're trying to um, develop some consistency from state to state because people move around so frequently. Uh, so if somebody asks me to do it, I'm almost always giving them the exact same language that I have written out that is very specific and very clear. So we'll see, like for example, Florida opened up their rules this year and changed all of their rules, and they now reflect the right terminology and the right process. Um, we've seen a couple other states open their rules. States are very nervous to open their rules, so if the state rules in your state are confusing or um, non-existent, it may be that they're afraid to open that process up, but I've worked with almost every state. In fact, at the end of this month, I'll go to the National Interstate Boards of Cosmetology, and we're doing a workday session there where 26 states are going to attend, and we're going to literally have them read their own infection control rules and determine how difficult is it to follow these rules, what should they say, and encourage them to try and go back and change those rules, make them more consistent. Great. Well, those are the only questions that we have so far. Um, so thank you so much, Leslie, for a great presentation. Um, I've seen this presentation probably close to 10 times now, um, and I always learn something new. So um, definitely think that it's good information to share. Um, so like I said, in a minute, once we close out the webinar, you are all going to see a survey box. Please take your time and fill out that survey. Um, I will get a follow-up email out to those of you who attended today, um, and I'm going to include a link to that Contagion video clip, um, as well as the Eyebrow Wax video, um, just because those are really worthwhile clips to have, um, and it, we kind of missed out on not being able to see those today, so I'm going to include those in the emails, but um, keep your eyes peeled for that to come. And so thank you again, Leslie, for a wonderful okay. webinar. Thank you. Have a great Monday. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.